Uh, Roberto Rivera gives me hope, and a whole bunch of hope, and we're thrilled that he'll close this Cincinnati conference. Roberto's one of those bright lights in the world who made a choice years ago. He could have gone down a path of huge trouble. He knew that path, but he chose another path, and boy, are we glad that he did, and he chose this path, he says, because of relationships in his life and discovering his spark of real hip-hop. He created his own major when he got his bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin. He said, I don't want to do a traditional major. I got something else I need to do, and I need to weave the arts and youth culture and social change together into one whole. And that became his degree. He's now in graduate school getting an advanced degree in youth development. Perhaps more importantly, this man is a catalyst for change. He exudes it. He lives it. He's a filmmaker, a poet, a writer, a playwright, and a gifted speaker. It is my privilege to introduce to you Roberto Rivera. One, two, one, two. Good morning. It's still morning, right? How's everybody doing? Fantastic. Before we get started, can we please give a big round of applause for all the organizers who helped to make this event possible. Let's give it up. And can we also give it up to our young people? You know, I speak at different national conferences around the country. And I must say that this is one of the most dynamic and empowered group of youth that I've ever encountered in my entire life. So let's give it up for the young people, y'all. Yeah. You know, I was talking to Peter earlier, and I was thinking, man, these young people are so empowered, and these sessions have been so amazing that if we go back and actually implement some of the things that we've been learning and support these young people to reach their true power and potential, we're going to have to rename and reclaim a few things. I don't know if we're going to have to be able to call the Search Institute the Search Institute anymore. We might have to change the name because these young people are going to have to create so much change, it'll be called the Found Institute. <laughs> so let's give it up for these young people again. It's been a joy to be able to connect with many of you, to hear about your organizations and your inspirational programs. But most of all, I've enjoyed hearing your personal stories. They've touched me deeply. And for those of you that I haven't connected with, I'm hoping to connect with you a little bit maybe after the conference so we can still connect, uh, even though I only have 23.14 uh, minutes, seconds left and going. <laughs> so we'll have a little bit more time afterwards. But uh, first and foremost, my name is Roberto Rivera, and I am a son, a husband, and a brother. And it's really in the spirit of a big brother that I want to come and speak with you all today. See, I had a really special relationship with my little brother, Gabriel. You know, my father was never in my brother's life. So I was not only his big brother, but also like a father figure for him. And so every week we would have a big brother day. And so we go out to Chuck E. Cheese, you know what I mean? And I'd be like one of the adults up in there with the balls, scaring the kids, or they'd have to call for backup. Oh, we got another big kid stuck in the tube. Can you bring the jaws of life, please? You know, but we'd have a good time. And so it hit me really hard when my little brother was diagnosed with leukemia at the age of six. And this little boy taught me so much about life. He taught me about the power of hope and how if you're facing death every day, how you can still persevere. This little boy taught me that the most important thing in this life is love. And when this little boy died in my arms in 2005, it hit me really hard. And I realized that not only did my little brother pass away, but the dreams that I had for my little brother passed as well. And so it was during this time that I had a spiritual awakening of sorts. And I realized that I had a calling. I was still supposed to be a big brother, but a big brother to a generation. And so now I stand as a big brother who's able to connect with these youth. 
able to speak their language and kind of act as an intermediary to also being able to talk that academic slash scholarly talk and to help connect the bridges from the youth to the parents and parents to the youth. And this has inspired the work that I currently do with the Good Life organization. And so the Good Life, we build bridges throughout the community with hopes of igniting that young person's voice and helping them to create change in their communities. We also have a program called Fulfill the Dream that uses hip hop. Do we have any young people in the house that like hip hop at all? So we've been able to start different chapters across the nation from LA to Chicago to Providence and hopefully beyond. But it's been an amazing journey in the last several years. And it's been awesome that this journey has brought me here to the search conference. And so I'm so happy and so honored to be here with so many of you. And I believe that right now, we are living in a very historic moment. I believe right now that the doors of history are swinging on the hinges of right now. I believe that our action or our inaction will determine whether or not these doors open up with our brightest day still being before us or if our inaction will mean that these doors close, creating an obstacle for future generations. You know, we're living in a crazy time right now, a time where many entities are benefiting off of the silencing of youth voice and keeping them powerless. They're entities like CCA and Wackenhut who make billions of dollars a year because they're part of the prison industrial complex, and they make billions off of our young people being locked up, and they can with pinpoint precision, tell how many beds they're gonna need in the future by looking at third grade reading scores. Other industries like the pharmaceutical industry, which in the last several years have tripled their number of psychiatric drugs that they sell to this population of school age youth. And I don't have any problems with psychiatric drugs, but when I go to schools across this nation and I see that 50% of the school population is on some sort of psychiatric drug and most of them haven't even seen a doctor, there's an issue with that. Other industries like the porn industry that makes $57 billion a year or the alcohol industry that uses $2 billion to advertise to our young people or these uh, companies that sell guns to our young people, but look, I don't come with the message of death and despair. I come with the message of hope and a message of life, and I hope you can breathe that in. See, I believe that this generation of young people has the opportunity of being some of the greatest leaders that we have ever seen. I believe that despite the fact of these ashes of death and despair, like the myth of the phoenix, they can begin to rise up with new fire and new hope in their wings and begin to lead us into a new direction and having a more beautiful future. I believe like Martin Luther King, like Gandhi, like Ella Baker, like Rosa Parks, they can not only tap into their passion and purpose, but yes, they can even tap into their pain and use that as fuel to help them to move towards possibility. And pain is a very interesting thing. It kind of reminds me of fire. And if fire is just kind of let loose, you can do a lot of destruction with it. You can burn down this whole building, even though it's really big and kind of, I call it the mothership. <laughs> you can take people's lives with it. But see, if fire can be harnessed, it can also be used to heat a room. This building was created because people use fire to construct it. And if used just right in a few weeks, you know, we're gonna maybe bake a little turkey or something, right? So it can also be used to nurture and to heal 